having me in your country. <laughs> I have things to say, be quiet. <laughs> Uh, right, I should introduce my, myself uh, briefly, first of all. Um, I hope you enjoyed what, what Will had to say earlier. Um, what I'm going to do is translate all of that into normal words. <laughs> <laughs> and see how all of that applies, hopefully, in the real world uh, to girls and women, right the way through the lifespan, thinking specifically about relationships. And relationships in all forms. Colleague relationships, buying stuff in the shops, work, uh, you know, personal relationships, friendships, all of those, those kind of things. Um, so, so hopefully we're, we're, we're going to do that. Um, to introduce myself, um, I am a late diagnosed uh, autistic woman. I love the idea that Will thought that 15 was late to be diagnosed. <laughs> I was 41. Uh, and I've certainly met people in their 60s and 70s and beyond uh, who've had that diagnosis. So I still think there's a long way to go for us who are over 30, uh, who appear to be missed enormously in any kind of autism research. It's almost as though we just don't exist or we just die at some, uh, expire at some given, given point. Um, I'm an independent trainer, speaker, author. I've written six books on autism. I have a master's degree in autism. Um, I'm a mum and a grandma um, of a diagnosed autistic son and uh, two undiagnosed but highly suspected uh, autistic <laughs> twin grandchildren. Um, <laughs> I also have an autistic partner. Uh, he's sitting in the middle. Uh, Leanne has stolen him for the session, um, but that's okay, because I'll take her out afterwards. <laughs> I'm bigger than her, I've had no fear. Um, I didn't get my diagnosis until after I had a master's degree in autism and had written five books and had worked in this field for over 10 years. Um, and that's very much what we're hearing and from Will, from other people, is that, that there, were, there just wasn't a female version of autism that fitted me. All of the training I did, all of the understanding I, I learned all the way through, it was all about this Rain Man, Sheldon, loner, nerd kind of boy. Um, uh, and, and it just didn't fit. I couldn't see how, how it made sense. I've had 35 jobs, a lifetime of mental health diagnoses, um, mental health problems, alcoholism, self-harm, you name it. It's like my special CV of the person you wouldn't want to employ uh, is, is me. <laughs> So everything you see is, is exactly it, is, is that actually it's only been really in the last few years that people have started, and myself included, from meeting more and more women and kept thinking, that's my life, that's my life, which eventually led me to kind of be diagnosed. So, so I'm very much kind of part of this story of this, this new understanding of how, how autism uh, fits, fits women. Um, and as, as, as Will says, the mental health diagnoses often come first. Um, interestingly, he mentioned borderline personality disorder. Um, I gave a talk at a, a conference of hospital psychiatrists, and they were wonderful people. Um, and one of them came up afterwards, and he said he was kind of shocked and pale. And he said, if you'd have walked into my clinic, I would have given you borderline personality disorder. I would never have thought of autism in the context of somebody who presents the way that you do. And so I think that's just really important that we have to recognize that, that there are still very important gatekeepers, clinicians out there who are making those kind of judgments through ignorance, um, that, that actually some of us become so good at pretending to be normal, um, that actually we're, we're virtually undetectable until you hear our stories, until you, you kind of go into that a, a, little, a little bit further. Uh, so that's what we're, we're going to talk about a, a little bit to, to today. So the social world of girls, what I want to do is, is that we, we kind of understand that there are elements to the female presentation. And again, I completely concur with Will. This is not strictly gender related. There are obviously boys and girls and those of other genders who, who flit between these profiles. But as he said, we're talking about tendencies in a population. Um, I work individually with about 60 autistic women a year. Um, and, and I'm not a researcher. I'm not an academic. Nobody takes what I say seriously. But actually, this really fits. And, and it's rare for me to meet a woman who doesn't fit somewhere around this, this profile that, that we've, been, we've been talking about. So uh, one of the books I wrote was about women and girls, and I did a, a literature review, um, and one of the things we kind of found out was that girls talk more than boys. <laughs> Who knew? 
But in terms of how girls might be missed or misdiagnosed, what this means is that a young autistic girl is chatty, is often very chatty, often precociously, hugely chatty, big vocabulary. This makes her look socially proactive, and so it doesn't necessarily fit with that traditional model of what autism might, might look like. So a number of the things I'm going to talk about is why these girls get missed, why they do fit the criteria, but actually in a slightly different way, that if you, if you don't necessarily pick that up in the right way, you're, you're, not going to, you're not going to consider autism as an option for them in, in terms of diagnosis. So this precocious speech, my mother says I, I spoke uh, full sentences at nine months old. So I'm a kind of female stewie. <laughs> Which is just weird. <laughs> and he has an English accent too, so it must be true. So this precociousness masks this underlying difficulty in social understanding. We become very good at set phrases, at scripting, of learning things, and, and not necessarily knowing what's going on underneath. One of the things that often comes up with girls is that they will talk, 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 and then you ask them a question, and suddenly it's blank, that you're expecting a very fast and articulate response, but actually it's not there. They've not understood you well. It's taken a lot of processing. Um, they look stupid. You end up looking stupid, and that's very much my experience. Coming over here at the, at the airport, um, I was asked by somebody, can you show me your return ticket? And I've never been asked that before, and I didn't know what that meant, so I just kept giving her my boarding pass because I had two of them, one for me and one for Keith. And I said, there. And she said, no, your return ticket. And I said, there. And she said, no, your return ticket. And I didn't know what that was because I've never been asked that before. So you end up looking and feeling ridiculous and scared. I don't know what to do. I don't know what the answer is. When actually, when you think about it, it's a really simple question. But actually, it wasn't available to me because all of that was, was kind of unexpected. So it, it ends up putting you in difficult situations, awkward, awkward situations. Uh, we heard about this idea of camouflaging. I think we have to be careful with this. I think, I, I think it's important, and, and Will did mention it, that it's not necessarily conscious. We don't walk around going, hey, I'm going to put this face on today. A lot of this is so innate now, because in early life, you learn that your real self's just not acceptable. And actually, you've got to find a way to do something about it. It's almost second nature to, to just be someone else. And sometimes, certainly, I can feel it that actually I leave the house and I go, OK, it's time to be this person. And, and it's a, an element of, having, of being aware that someone else is almost coming out for the day um, and that me is at home and, and, and me is different and me is quiet and, and me doesn't talk to people, which seems a bit of a weird thing to do when I'm talking to you. But this isn't social interaction. This is a monologue on a special interest with a script and a time-bound... This is the most autistic job in the world. <laughs> People think this is flexible. Uh -uh. <laughs> I don't have to know your names. I don't have to make eye contact. I don't have to remember the names of your kids. And I don't have to buy milk for the tea in the office. <laughs> it's perfect. So copying, lots of people, um, there, there is this, there, there, as, as well as this unconscious uh, camouflaging, there is also a, a distinctive copying. People talk about copying laughs, they cop uh, faces, clothes, personalities, voices, almost bringing in parts of these other people uh, in order to, to be someone better because that, that innate long, long-term image uh, uh, impression that you have is that you is not quite up to scratch. So I need to be, do something about that, therefore off I need to go. Continuing to think about that in the context of social relationships, what does that make you look like? It either makes you look invisible and more capable than you are, or it makes you look weird. And so, you know, this, this girl, she's working hard, but it may well not necessarily be having the results that, that she requires. Uh, in, historically, people talked about uh, little boys with Asperger's as being little professors. Uh, and what we talk about little girls being is little psychologists. So uh, again, as Will said, rather than necessarily studying objects and trains and dinosaurs, often the girls study people. I've met a number of adult women who are therapists and counselors and psychologists themselves, which seems like a very bizarre per a type of profession to go into when you're somebody that might struggle intuitively to, to pick up people skills and, and those sorts of things. But these women have studied people so long. They watch them. They observe them. Uh, little girls sitting on the edge of the playground. They are watching, 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 taking in all of this stuff. They read fiction in order to understand relationships as though it was some kind of instruction manual. 
there's all sorts of things about this female autism which really goes against the grain of what we know uh, about autism in, in a more traditional kind of sense. A lot of the women that I interviewed for my book said that people thought they were shy, um, but they didn't feel shy and they didn't want to be shy. They just didn't know what to say or they just felt and learned quickly that, that not saying anything was the safest way to be because when you opened your mouth, the chances were that what came out of it was going to be difficult or, 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 or wrong in, in some way uh, and, and you would be, be criticised uh, for, for those things. There's also a whole load of stuff around imagination that in the traditional uh, autism uh, trait um, characteristics, we say that autistic people don't have an imagination, they don't do pretend play. What seems to be coming across uh, anecdotally in women is that often they have enormous fantasy worlds because these worlds are better than the world that they live in. Having an imaginary friend that never lets you down, never confuses you, never bullies you, uh, is actually much easier than trying to get a real one who may well go and play with somebody else um, when you just want them to, 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 to play with you and, and, and play, play by yourself. I've certainly met a number of girls and young women who take on personas of, of animals, of characters, um, girls who wear cat ears and tails, um, girls who crawl around the floor pretending to be a wolf, believing they are a wolf, um, just wanting to be something else. One young woman said to me, she said, I want to be a cat because it doesn't matter how old you are. If you're a cat, people always look after you. I'm, I'm frightened of being an adult. I'm 17. Um, and again, interestingly, the kind of anorexia thing. Some of, some of these girls almost consciously, subconsciously, remain small, remain childlike, remain speaking in quite a childlike way, because actually, maybe if I do that, then I won't have to go out into the world, which is tough and which is difficult for, for me to, to, to manage in. Um, so, so maybe there's a, a, bit of a, a bit of a link there. Um, and certainly within, within adult worlds, so I, I know women who have huge worlds of, of hundreds of characters, that all have, have lives and personalities and environments. Uh, this is not delusion, it's not psychosis. They are actively choosing to spend time in their own heads because it just feels like a better place to be than, than, than out here uh, trying hard and, and, and failing uh, in order to, you know, to, to fit in with, with people. Uh, in terms of activity choices, um, lots of reading. Reading fiction, as I said, is a big deal for a lot of these girls. Lego uh, comes in uh, big, collecting anything, pencil shavings, toilet paper, elastic bands, socks, you name it. The, the collecting things is, is exciting because there's a completeness to it. There's an organization. There, there's something wonderful about those things. Nature comes a lot. Coloring, drawing. Most of these things are solo pursuits. Or if they're not solo pursuits, they can be. So it may be that she would like to do these things with somebody alongside her, quietly doing that to, with her, but it doesn't require another person for that. It's not necessarily a joint game. Um, and that came across a lot, a lot of the women I meet. It just doesn't occur to them, even in adult life, to contact someone else to do something with. So if you're gonna go shopping for the day, some of you will immediately think, oh, I'm gonna go shopping. I'll get someone to come with me. For a lot of us, myself included, that thought never, ever enters my head that I would get someone to come with me to do things. I would just do it on my own. It, it, that sort of social, kind of bigger picture just isn't there. Who would like to come with me? Who might be free? Never happens. So that there's something very innate and different, I think, about the way autistic people um, meet those, those sort of relationships and, and, and social activities. So if she likes doing things that only require her, how does she have friends? How does she bring people into that, that world? It's, it's, it's a more difficult thing for people to want to do if their idea of fun is, is something a little more uh, group-based or, or team-based. In terms of peer relationships, a, a lot of people that I, that I interviewed uh, described themselves as tomboys. They, they, they felt that, that in terms of a, a typical gender spectrum, that, that their preferences were for more physical activities, getting dirty, climbing trees, playing with nature. They weren't necessarily into having tea parties and those sorts of things. And if they did, then they tended to be rehearsing scripts of situations that had already happened. 
So it may well be that the child looks like they're having all sorts of imaginary scenarios when their dolls and their toys are talking to each other. But if you listen closely, what you might be hearing is a conversation between mum and dad or a conversation between the teacher and another child that they are just replaying uh, through, their, through their, their, their toys. But on the face of it, it might look perfectly typical. Again, these are all reasons why clinicians don't necessarily pick up these girls. Does your, does your daughter play with toys? Yes, she does. Maybe she just lines them up. Maybe she just uses them as, as real friends. Maybe she just replays situations through her, through her day with them. It's not necessarily as simple as it looks on, on, the, on the surface level uh, that, that she is, she is uh, doing those, those kind of things. She either tends to be the really bossy kid who takes over everything, or quite a passive kid who ends up being mothered and looked after perhaps by a slightly more popular, slightly more socially able person. So quite often, this girl doesn't look alone. If you look at her out in the playground, she may well have someone with her. And again, that means that she's not being picked up as having any kind of social difficulty. Has she got any friends? Yes, she has. She's always with this particular person. So again, our, our belief about what autism should look like uh, is often slightly confounded. But if again, if we look at that relationship, we might find that it's not terribly reciprocal. It's a bit one-sided. I met someone the other day as an adult, and she said that she was aware that she had friends who were, she was there, uh, they were her number one friend, but if she was lucky, she might be their number 75 friend. So this real awareness, and that's something that, that just absolutely feels true to me. I, mean, I, I used to call it uh, tears, tears of friendship, like levels of friendship, that I was always very conscious that I never seemed to be on anybody's number one tier friend. I would be invited where well, lots of people were being invited, but I wouldn't necessarily be invited for a one-to-one -one or something like that. And I think this is, this is quite common, this, this concept that this person uh, seeking exclusivity, this same woman, she was 50, and she said it was only in the last five years that she'd come to terms with it being okay that her friend had other friends, that, that she just wanted that one-to-one -one relationship with this person, and she was hurt when this person wanted to hang out with other friends and other acquaintances, which is typical, which is what most, most people do. But there's constantly this sense that you're not first choice, that, that you're somewhere further down. Another thing that people, women particularly, often say, uh, and it, it's weird how often the same conversations come up time and time again, completely independently, is the idea that when you start a job somewhere, um, and you may have been there for a year, two years, Somebody new comes into the organization, and what these women witness is that that new staff member will be going out for coffee, will be sharing lunch, will be doing social things with her colleagues in a way that she has never managed to do, even though she may have been there for years. And it puzzles them. They go, I don't, what am I doing wrong? I'm friendly, I'm kind, I'm helpful. What am I doing wrong? And I don't know the answer, but there's definitely something, some sense you're just not kind of connecting at the same level with other women uh, in those sorts of environments. And it's not deliberate, and it's not bullying, and it's not intentionally unpleasant. It's just a kind of almost invisibility that, that you're not really seen as a, as a, as a key person to, to build, to build a, a relationship with, that there's something we do or don't do that doesn't, doesn't quite, quite work that out. And if you know what that is, I'd be very grateful to know. <laughs> And I didn't want to be friends with you anyway. <laughs> so the key challenges for girls, and there are plenty of them, is that she doesn't really fit anywhere. Um, she's not a boy, she's not a girl, in terms of sort of peer groups. Uh, and, and often, and obviously we're, we're talking here about the sort of Asperger profile, so people with, with average level IQ and really good self-awareness. Um, and typically, I meet parents who say that their, their daughters are aware by six or seven years of age, I don't fit in, people don't like me, I can't get it right. So at a really early age, they have this enormous awareness that actually I don't belong in some way. So without diagnosis, without explanation, how are we giving them any, any, any tools to be able to say, there's a reason for this, and it's okay, and there's lots of people like you, and it's fine but actually you're looking in the wrong place for your friendships. Maybe we need to steer you somewhere else in, in terms of, of, of those friendships. 
We know that in terms of gender expectations, that, that there are expectations for women and girls that there just aren't for men. They're different. You're expected to be nurturing and, and people-pleasing and subtle and all of those kind of things. And, and often autistic women just can't do that. They just don't know how to do that. Um, and so sometimes you can be judged very harshly for just being yourself um, because you're not playing those social games. You're not complimenting the teacher. You're, you're, not, you know, you're, not, you're not doing the smoothing, the stroking that, that sometimes people need in, in those, those places. We know there's a lot of gender stuff in autism, that a lot of people don't relate necessarily to, to typical binary gender models, either in terms of their sexuality or in terms of their gender identity, in terms of their presentation of their gender. And that, again, goes all the way through life. How do you deal with that? You feel weird, you look weird, you don't belong. It's no wonder that a lot of these girls suffer, as we know, uh, enormous mental health problems. High rates of depression, high rates of, of, of mental health, high, high rates of suicide. One of the highest rates of all, all people are women with autism uh, for suicide, beyond the rates of, of typical young men. There was a recent study by Simon Baron Cohen um, that looked, looked into, into suicide ideation and suicide attempts, um, and it's high. Um, you know, it's high. Life's tough, and, and you know, these are able and brilliant women, and yet somehow the messages that they're getting is you're, you're just not up to scratch. And, and we can do something about that, and, and we, we need to be able to, to do something about that in order to, to help them and, and, to, and to support them. In terms of education, academically, being clever is not enough. Um, I had an IQ of 153. Um, I didn't do particularly well at school. I didn't understand the questions. Um, and I think there's an expectation sometimes from parents and sometimes from educators that being bright will see you through, but it doesn't. Being social sees you through. That's, that's what matters. When you go to university, when you go to the workplace, when you want to have relationships that make your life feel meaningful, it's not how smart you are. It's about being able to get on with people, being able to understand people and make sense of things without bending too far, without too much camouflaging without becoming mentally unwell because of the work it's taking you just to walk through the door, just to remember somebody's name, just to know who the hell someone's face is when you haven't got a clue because they're coming up to you and you don't recognize people. And that's a problem. Uh, to have to do that all of the time, it's, it's tricky. Academically, we know, and again, some, some women I spoke to suggested that, that female teaching staff, I'm sorry if this is you, but maybe there's a kind of reflection here. That, that, that sometimes, and again, I've spoken to groups of teaching staff, and, and people have been very honest and said, yeah, that's me, I, I can get that. Sometimes these are not girls you warm to easily. They are too intense, they frown, they ask you questions, they challenge you, they knew more about Tudor history than you do. <laughs> and they tell you in front of the whole class <laughs> because they're trying to be helpful but that hurts your ego, that hurts your sense of authority, your sense of hierarchy, your sense of, hey, I'm the teacher here. Sometimes these girls end up being labeled in ways which actually are just part of who they are. They're not disruptive, they're not naughty, they don't have behavior problems. They're just trying to tell you that you've got something wrong and there's no, no other way to, to go about that and, and do that. So I think there's definitely a gender thing between teaching staff and some of these girls where there's just a bad fit. It, it just doesn't, doesn't kind of kind of work. Uh, we mentioned the idea of having this excellent vocabulary, but, but this, this poor, poor comprehension. Um, and I was really interested in, the, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. What was your name? Hannah. About saying that you could write an essay in 10 minutes and people don't believe that you can do that. And I've, I have exactly the same thing. I've signed up for PhDs and... And, I, and they said, oh, it'll take you three years and it'll be full time. And, and I'll say, well, I did my master's, wrote two 40,000 world books, was a single parent, went to work full time and had my own business. I think I'll be OK. <laughs> and that was just one year. And, and they go, no. No one can do a PhD without spending 50 hours a week for three years. And I'm thinking, what are they doing? <laughs> And I had a wonderful supervisor who said, I said, what is this? I, I, what is this? What are they doing? And he said, ah, oh, just, he said, just hang around for 18 months, do the whole thing in nine and shove it in at the last minute. It'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's really hard for some people to believe just quite how amazingly fast your brain could work. And yet you can't answer a question at an airport about where your return ticket is. <laughs> 
spiky profile. It's in autism. It's very much there. And you look capable on top of all of that, but not too capable. You can't possibly write essays in 10 minutes. <laughs> but we can. It'd be dangerous when you're in charge of the world, wouldn't it? <laughs> a lot of teen tasks in education have a social element. You get a bunch of kids and you say, go and do a project, make me a report, do a presentation, whatever. You are getting that group of children to socialize. They have to negotiate which is your bit, which is my bit, what am I going to do? You're really good at that. I'm not so good at that. All of that is social. We have to think about taking some of that away for some girls who cannot participate in that. Because what will happen if we don't is that she will either take over completely, like some kind of dictatorship, <laughs> or she will withdraw completely and do absolutely nothing. Neither way will give us a full representation of what she's good at. We have to take the social stuff away, allocate tasks, think about the groups you're putting this girl into. Can they be small? One other person, two other people? Can we think about who we put her with? Can we say, why don't you do the research? Why don't you do the presentation? Why don't you do the artwork? Give her the stuff she's good at. Let her shine. Let her sell herself what she is good at, what her autism maybe brings her, gives her social status. This is the kind of stuff that some of these girls need. What can we sell in this girl? For me, um, I, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, with, uh, with England, uh, but my father comes from a city called Liverpool. And Liverpool, uh, uh, the people of Liverpool are called Scousers, and the people of Liverpool are known for having the cruelest and fastest sense of humour that you have ever heard. Now, my mother was the autistic one in my family. My father is a Scouser. And so people often say to me, well, how come you've got a sense of humour? Autistic people never have a sense of humour. And I always say, well, I'm half autistic and half Scouse. <laughs> And so this, is a, this was my status. The way I made friends was by being funny, was by being the weird, doing the weird stuff, paddling in the stream outside school in my shoes and my socks, and people going, is she going to do it today? Is she going to do it today? Yeah, of course I would. Anything for a bit of sad, superficial attention. <laughs> my mother would smack me around the head every single day for doing this, but it didn't matter because actually it was, I bought myself status by being funny, by being different, by being quirky, because I couldn't buy myself status in any other way. I couldn't have those relationships. I ended up being a professional stand-up comedian. Worked for me for a bit. Um, but actually that same thing still remains. Whenever I meet new people, there's constantly in my head is, say something funny, say something funny, because that's all I know how to do. There isn't much depth to that. And so relationships are quite superficial because people think, oh, you're good fun to be around. But there's not much more. I don't know what to say next. And so often we see girls coming up with these different strategies. Um, and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe if we see that she has a skill, let's let her use it. Because probably that's what she'll do for a living in, in later life. The thing that she's good at, the thing that she excels at, the thing that makes her feel good about herself in, in some way. Uh, and typically, I've, I've certainly seen that a, 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 lot, of, a lot of times. Uh, we know a lot of these girls are perfectionists um, and that that can be wonderful, but it can be brutal and, and damaging and difficult for her to accept that something is okay when it's a 70% job, that it doesn't have to be 100%. We don't have time for 100%. We don't even know what 100% looks like, but she will go and go and go looking, looking for that absolute perfection. So there's lots of conversations, lots of perspective that, that we can put in here uh, to try and support her to... to to go easy on herself, to understand that it's, it's all right. It doesn't have to be quite, quite the way she, she thinks it needs to be. Educationally, again, social stuff is not always great. Uh, we need to keep an eye on some of the friends. There may be a different hidden agenda there that she's not going to spot. Are they really good for her? Are they really friends? Uh, I remember one woman saying that people would come for sleepovers in her house, um, and it was only years later that she realised that actually they never talked to her and they never played with her. They just came round, watched videos, ate all her food, um, and she was just kind of there to almost serve them. And when they had sleepovers, she was never invited. And it took her years to notice this. Because when you're a kid, you don't. You're just kind of like, yeah, that's the way it is. It's okay, it's okay. But actually, years and years later, she just thought, hang on, that's, that's not how it was. This idea of friends that I had... Was, was not true, was, was not the full picture. Other people had agendas. Other people could spot 
a naivety, a gullibility, a, 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 an open-heartedness um, that actually she, she didn't know that there was anything else going on because she just saw things in those very, very uh, plain ways. Uh, girls may not be her natural peers. Uh, a lot of women I meet prefer the company of boys um, and find them easier, less complicated, particularly moving into teenage years. That boys are often still want to talk about computer games, still want to talk about um, knowledge, science, interesting stuff, still want to be physical. Um, and the girls obviously move uh, into talking about more personality-based topics in teenage years, which they, they find difficult. So if we're thinking about trying to build social relationships with some of these girls, let's not just stick with same age, same gender peers. They might be older, they might be younger, they might be of a different gender. We need to really think more broadly about who she's going to be friends with. Because I think sometimes we just go, where's a girl in her class that we can pal her up with? And probably if you're trying to pal her up with the most popular girl in, in the whole room, she's just going to hate you for that. Because there is nothing worse than standing next to somebody who is really good at this stuff to make you feel that you're really terrible at it. And if you already have that awareness, you certainly don't want to be put in that position. And this, this popular girl is going to tire of you very quickly because you're not going to play that social game uh, in, a, in a particularly natural, natural way. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, sometimes these are girls that, that choose consciously or subconsciously to adapt later than other people. They don't want to do the boyfriend thing. They don't want to grow up. They don't want to, to have uh, uh, things like periods, um, and, you know, uh, puberty. All of those changes are just, they, you didn't ask for them and they're just happening to you anyway. Um, they're very overwhelming and, and very difficult for, for some people to, to manage. So, so for some people, it's certainly a, a desire to remain back where they were uh, in, a, in, the, in the other world. Uh, just briefly, just thinking about the school environment uh, in terms of um, the, the sensory environment. And again, what does that mean for your friendships? Uh, if the canteen is, is too noisy, is too echoey, is too difficult, is too busy, where do you go to hang out with people if that's where everybody else is? Uh, if you're the kid that's hiding under the stairwell or, or walking around the back of the sheds, which a lot of these children do, how do you have relationships when everybody else can cope uh, in those very noisy and sensory uh, type, types, types of in, environments? We know about the mental health. Um, a lot of girls uh, were diagnosed before their autism diagnosis uh, with OCD, with school phobia, with social anxiety, with borderline personality disorder. All of these things in any other name are facets of autism for, for some young women. Not everybody, certainly. But it's almost as though autism just was never even on the table for a lot of girls and a lot of women uh, um, who exhibited these, these associated mental, mental health uh, issues. Moving on to teenage years, um, just, just an awful, awful time. Uh, the worst years of my life, peering in from the outside. There seem to be different groups of young women. Some are just resolutely themselves. They will not wear bras. They will not shave their legs. They will just be themselves. And that's wonderful, but it comes at a price. I remember working with a, a very well-developed young woman who just couldn't see why she needed to wear a bra. It was uncomfortable, it was horrible. Why? I have my clothes on, why? But in society's view, to see a very well-endowed young woman who very obviously is not wearing a bra, that means that you get attention that you didn't ask for. So it's having to try and respect her rights to do as she pleases, but at the same time, give her that external bigger picture and context which says, you can do this, but this is what will happen to you. This is how people will treat you. Can, can we find a solution? Can we find a compromise that works for everybody, that, that keeps you safe, that stops you getting this unwanted attention, these un, un, unwanted um, impressions of who you are because you choose to, to be this way? but also to, that maintains your comfort and those sorts of things. So it's hard to, to, to draw this, walk this thin line between being you and, and not being judged uh, in, in these teenage and, and upward years. Um, the, the physical stuff I, I mentioned briefly, the, 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 the periods, the hygiene, a lot of young women will need teaching this stuff explicitly. If you think about who told you about periods or told you about sanitary protection, told you about deodorant, told you about shaving your legs or your, or your armpits, it was probably your friends. And if you don't have that peer group of friends, who is going to tell you? Probably nobody. And if you're not necessarily socially inclined, you're not going to naturally pick this stuff up. It's very high bullying stuff. 
If you're the kid that comes in and you're sweaty and you're smelly and you haven't washed and your hair is greasy, it just gives people another reason to think that you're different or think that you're weird. This stuff has to be taught. We cannot assume that some of these young women will naturally pick this stuff up because some of them don't because they didn't know it was coming. Just one day, here I am and I have breasts and I'm covered in hair. Oh my God, <laughs> what do I do now? I know it doesn't happen in just one day. <laughs> Really, I don't think so. So don't worry about it if it hasn't happened to you yet. It won't happen in one day. <laughs> so there are some that are unashamedly themselves, and there are some that try and try and try, and they copy the rules, and they put makeup on, and they do this stuff, and they, they desperately want to fit in in some kind of way. But it seems such a mystery. Um, there will be people in this room, uh, women, maybe, maybe some gentlemen as well, that at some point in your life, maybe somewhere in your teenage years, something happened to you overnight, and the next morning, you woke up, and somewhere in your head, you said, I will never leave the house without makeup again. Some of you do not ever leave the house without makeup. When did that happen? How did that happen? Certainly for people like me, that day just never came. <laughs> we do not have the makeup gene. We just about have the hairbrush gene. That's about as far as it goes. It's just time consuming, it's pointless, but, but it's a weird response. I've had people say to me, you're so lucky, you don't have to wear makeup. And I think, but I just woke up like this. I didn't do anything. You're the one that did the thing of putting the makeup on. You too could leave the house looking like this. <laughs> How does that make me lucky? I don't understand. Maybe you're just, uh, I, I always think, you know, if you sleep with somebody and you wear makeup, at least for me, they don't get any surprises in the morning. <laughs> I look exactly the same as I did the night before. <laughs> so we have this problem in teenage years. Often it's about these girls are comparing themselves to, to other young women, and this is so important. And the people they compare themselves to are the top, top, top end of the popular girls. They don't compare themselves to someone slightly less nerdy than themselves and go, I want to be like her. They go, no, I want to be like her. She's fabulous and, and does all this stuff. And that just makes you feel terrible. It's like, you know, comparing yourself to an elite athlete when you can just jog around the block. It's a, about comparing yourself to a supermodel, you know, when you're a perfectly adequate shaped person. And this, you know, this black and whiteness of autism often says, look, if I'm going anywhere, I'm going for perfect. And that's a mission to fail. And again, we've got to talk to these girls and say, look, you know, where's the evidence? Show me how many people in the world look like this. Show me if these people are happier. Show me this. Go for data. That's where you're going to get uh, buy-in from autistic people is data. Get the evidence out there. L let's look at this stuff. Rather than going, oh, no, 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 you're fine as you are. That's just emotional platitudes. That's meaningless. We need facts. I need to know how much better that girl's life is going to be better than mine. <laughs> is it going to be worth it? Probably not. I constantly do that when I look at you know, people on the TV and things, and they look amazing, and they're you know, so rich and wonderful, and you just think, actually, they are completely crazy. <laughs> and they have their relationships struggle. They are, you know, often, often people who have all this uh, apparent uh, a huge advantage are often appear to be very unhappy people. And, and I... From an autistic perspective, we almost have to tell ourselves that in a very defined way. Otherwise, you know, you kind of get, get caught up into some of these sort of thought patterns that that's the way I need to be and anything less is a, is a failure of, of, some, of some description. So moving on to adult life, um, we're still the little psychologists. We're still working this stuff out day in, day out, still trying to make sense of all of these, these kinds of things. Often, uh, certainly for me, there is this absolute switch of, of switching on a professional self that comes away from, from my natural self, um, and then it switches back off again. It's highly stressful. It's, it's highly bad for my health, I'm sure. A lot of adrenaline, a lot of stress, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of worry um, in, in order to do that. But it makes us increasingly invisible. And I think as we get older, and I'm 49, that actually you become a bit cynical and you become a bit of a realist. And you think, really? Am I really going to walk around the world being my true and open self? I don't think so. I can't get a job when I'm trying hard. So there's no hope if I actually am who I really, really am. So it's best that I just stay hidden. It's best that I just, just you know, accept to a certain degree um, what's possible and, 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 and what's not.
And this never becomes entirely fluent, this, this practicing at being with people. Um, as a mother, I remember... Um, using other parents as a kind of social barometer, that I was never sure what the rules were, what was okay for my children at different times. And so if my, my son or my daughter said, oh, you know, I want to go out, what, you know, what time do I need to be home? I would say, what time does John's mother think <laughs> that he needs to be home? And they would say, oh, seven o'clock or something. And I'd say, okay, that's seven o'clock it is then. <laughs> John's mother could have been completely insane. <laughs> but I figured she probably had a better grasp of things than I did. So constantly looking for cues, constantly checking, constantly watching, reading emails. Did that person put a kiss? If they put a kiss, I'll put a kiss. Well, I'll never put a kiss first. If they didn't put a kiss, constantly looking. How did they sign off? Did they say hi or did they say dear? Did they say Miss Hendricks? Did they say Sarah? Constantly, constantly checking, checking, checking every minute of your life to try and keep yourself within some kind of acceptable framework. What's everybody else wearing? What are they doing? How many cakes are they having? That's too many. Put three back. <laughs> having to do this all of the time. It is incredibly hard work. I don't put the three back very often. <laughs> Social expectations of women, again, in adulthood, are still absolutely there. Um, this, this sense that you will be socially driven or emotionally driven, that you will have feminine behavior, whatever that might mean, that you'll make the tea, that you can do this kind of stuff. Um, somebody, we were talking to somebody the other day, and they, they were, we were talking about uh, running a bed and breakfast or a guest house or something, um, and, and, and this person looked straight at me, and he said, there'll be lots of cleaning and he just looked at me, and my partner was there, and I was thinking, what's he looking at me for? Why is cleaning my thing? It's constantly this, this messages in life that, that this is how you're supposed to be. This is how things, things are, that you can pick up on this stuff. For me, female peers are just not, are not my friends. Um, neurotypical women are frightening, um, really frightening to me. I'm sorry, but you are. You're terrifying. <laughs> One of the things that people do to me quite a lot um, is they touch me on the arm. And people do that when I speak, and they come up and they say, oh, that was great, thank you, and they touch me on the arm. And I don't know why you do that. How does that make any difference to anything? It doesn't change the message. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything different. I don't know what you want. Uh, you know, are you coming on to me? Are you <laughs> sacking me? It can mean so many things, that, can't it? Oh, I'm sorry, your cat's just died. It could mean that. It could mean, um, I want to give you a job. It could mean all sorts of things. But interestingly, whenever I talk about this, somebody, and it'll probably happen today, that somebody will walk up afterwards and they will go, oh, yeah, thanks very much for that. And then as soon as they do that, they will go, oh, my God. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> like kryptonite or something. <laughs> Thereby making the situation far more socially awkward than it was in the first place. <laughs> So I'm fine to be touched, it's fine. I don't know why you do it, but I'm good with it. So yeah, don't, don't worry. But no hugging, that's too far. <laughs> so as an adult, my capacity is really small uh, in terms of social interaction. I have a small number of friends. Interestingly, a few of them have been diagnosed autistic after me. Um, quite a lot of them. One of them has an autistic son. One of them's worked uh, in the autism field in, in education for a long time. But again, all of us, it's taken us well into our 40s before it's all kind of gone, ah, that's why we, we're like we are. And, ah, that's why we're friends. Because we're people who have very intermittent social relationships. Uh, we don't see each other for weeks and weeks on end. We don't contact each other at all. One of the big things that comes up when I talk to women is about maintenance of relationships. And I say to them, well, you know, how often do you contact your, your friends and your acquaintances in between activities, in between meetings? How, long, how often do you maintain? Go, hi, how you doing? How did that job interview go? Oh, you know, hope you got to work okay. And sometimes they look at me and go, what's that? You have to do that? And genuinely, there are a lot of people out there that have absolutely no idea that in order to keep a relationship, it's like a petrol tank in a you know, gas tank in a car. If you don't fill it up, it runs dry, and that's the end of it. That you have to top this thing up. And actually, a lot of women say, and men on the autistic spectrum, I'm not very good at that stuff. And at the same time, they say, I don't have many friends. And I say, well, what about maintenance? And they say, I'm not very good at that stuff. But they don't necessarily see that those two things go together. That you cannot say, I wish people liked me more, when you are not 
doing the stuff that, that non-autistic people require you to do in order to have those relationships. They just kind of forget, forget you. A lot of people say they never initiate contact, and then they grumble because nobody contacts them. And actually, there's a, there's a two-way thing here. So even as bright, intelligent adults, somebody needs to tell us this stuff gently. When we're grumbling about not having any friends, when we're grumbling about nobody talking to us, we have to say, well, actually, what are you doing? Because this is a two-way thing. You can't just sit there and wait for the world to come and want to be your friend. If you're not saying, well, this is why you should be my friend. This is what I've got to offer. This is, this is me. We've got to put ourselves out there and learn how to do, to do that kind of stuff. It, it's not implicitly learned. It, it's, ex, it's explicit and needs, needs to be explicit. For me, I don't want more friends. I'm very happy to see my friends on a one-to-one -one basis. My social capacity is about an hour and a half um, of, of any length. Um, after that, I become very tearful. I become very exhausted, very drained. Um, I can only work a certain number of days at a time without having to have three or four days or more off. And off means at home, it means alone, it means barely leaving the house. And I think, again, it's that spikiness that, that seeing a lot of these women, we look so capable when we're out here. Um, but, a, but a good friend of mine, who's not a woman, he's a man, um, but he's gay, so he's nearly there. <laughs> uh, he's Dr. Dean Beadle, he's a, an autistic speaker in, in Britain, and, and he says, um, I need to spend time away from people in order to be able to be with people. So it's not just about being outwardly social, it's about having to go away, regroup, get everything together, and then I can be really brilliant for a really short space of time, but then I'm heading off again. And you mustn't take that personally, and it doesn't mean I don't love you, and it doesn't mean I don't value your company, but please don't expect me to do that five days a week or, or for five days or to go on vacation with you or to come and stay at your house. That all of those things are not possible, but in those small concentrated pockets, we're great friends and, and, and I love that. But not every day, not every week, not every month to, to be fair. And I, I think it's that, it's not black and white. We're not loners and we're not sociable. We're, we're kind of sociable loners. We, we like small pockets often with selected people. I think if people are too flaky, too unreliable, too complicated, too social, too huggy, to want to want to ask you about handbags, they're not our people. <laughs> we want to talk about stuff, films, stuff. I don't know, travel, history, whatever it whatever it might be. So it's it's kind of selective social stuff, really, rather than trying to shove a kind of square peg into a round hole in a social environment. It's not just about going, get out there, make friends. Where are these friends? How many do I need to have? How often do I need to see them? What are we going to do when we get there? We want to do that stuff, but it, it kind of needs to be a little bit on our, on our own, own terms. I did a little survey. I'm, I'm giving a presentation next week in, in Britain, and I was asked to talk about quality of life for adults with autism. Um, and, and I was really interested in trying to cover this idea of older age, because so few people do. So I did a little mini poll on Twitter, and, and I said, what concerns you most about getting older? Um, and, and the women that came forward, it's usually women that answer these kind of things, because they love talking about this kind of stuff. They said, um, loneliness. I'm worried about loneliness. I'm lonely now, and, and I'm scared of being lonely. The other thing they were terrified of is living in a group care home. So there's a contradiction here. I'd love to be with people, but not them, <laughs> in that kind of setting. So we do want to be with people. We are lonely. We're desperately lonely. And, and this, this kind of finding of the tribe, as Irene said, has been so valuable other autistic women are your tribe. You know, that's, that's where the information is. And there's some amazing people out there talking about this kind of stuff, which I'll get to in, in, in just a second. Uh, there's a little thing I think that autistic people do, uh, which is, which is a, I, I think is, is a possibly an, an error if you're trying to make friends uh, with, with neurotypical people. Um, and that, I uh, liken it to a kind of fishing analogy. I think autistic people tend to be kind of harpoon fishers. <laughs> So they find somebody in their sights, and they aim for them. And the reason that they found that person is because they like the look of them, or they have a shared interest, or that person has a car, or, or there's some kind of useful, interesting facet about them. And what I have learned from many of my audiences, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that for non-autistic people, it's more of a net fishing experience in making friends. 
So what you tend to do is to spread the net widely. You're friendly and you're warm and you're social to all sorts of people. And one or two of those people will stick. Yeah, is that roughly how it happens, sort of, when you make friends? Yeah, yeah good, thank you. <laughs> Don't disagree with me. I haven't got time. So it's, it's a matter of sort of personality, of, of osmosis, of, of drawing that kind of stuff together. Whereas I think for autistic people, we just don't have the energy for that, to, to be nice to everybody. We have to kind of target that energy in, in, into that kind of, kind of thing. Um, I met a, a woman and, and she said that when she was a teenager that, that she had desperately wanted to have a gang of friends and she had targeted these very, very popular girls in her school and she had decided with ninja-like precision that the way to get them to be her friends was with them invite them round to her house for a, for a party or a sleepover using some very fine stationery. And that was the key to her plan, was the stationery. That was it. And she was aware of this, and she said they will not be able to resist the stationery. <laughs> really. If you don't know about autism and stationery, you know nothing. <laughs> She, so this was her plan, and she sent all these invitations out. How could they refuse? I'll just sit back here and wait for them all to roll by. Not one of them turned up, not a, not a single person. What she later realized was that actually this person, people weren't being cruel, they weren't being unkind, that she was just not even on their radar. It was a big school. She, they didn't even know who she was. But from her perspective, she had targeted them, and not necessarily kind of, they probably just got this invitation and thought, who's this? Poor, whatever. But from her perspective, it was very much about, they're the people I want. It didn't occur to her to think whether that could be reciprocated. Do they know who I am? Do we want the same things? What would that relationship be like? Just didn't occur to her to, to do that at all. And again, a friend of mine quite recently, uh, an, another autistic woman, she said, I found someone at work that I'm going to be friends with. <laughs> and I said, that's stalking. <laughs> No, 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 it's not. No, it's not. I want to go swimming, and she goes swimming, and I haven't got anyone to go swimming with, and she's really nice, and I think we'll get on. And I said, no, that's, that's great. I said, but that, I don't think that's how most people, you know, go easy. I don't think that's how most people make friends. So I, I think there's a kind of fundamental difference in the way we often go about finding people in our lives um, that the non-autistic people might, might do uh, th those sorts of things. The dangerous stuff when we're heading into kind of adult relationships is that often there's a difficulty in reading interest and reading lack of interest. And so there are small numbers of people who end up in a lot of trouble, um, either as victims of sexual assault and, and rape and abuse, um, but also sometimes as perpetrators of those sorts of things because they didn't understand that this person wasn't interested. They've, they've got involved in something and been very um, angry when that hasn't been reciprocated or somebody's changed their mind about the way that they feel about someone. So I think there's a, there's a real naivety and a, and a danger for, for some adult autistic women. We just don't see that other people might not be quite as straightforward uh, as, as we are. Um, and that's, a, that, that's certainly a problem for, for some people. <laughs> For some, there's certainly a different motivation in terms of choosing a partner. I met one woman who said that she wanted to marry her husband um, because he had some home gym equipment that she wanted to use. <laughs> and we're not here to judge the basis of love or marriage or relationships. But for her, that was more important than a lot of those kind of nebulous chemistry type things that, that we, we might talk about. Um, so, yeah, for, so for some people, there, there is very much a, a different way of thinking about love, uh, about you know, what, what a relationship might, might, might look like. Um, and thinking about, I mean, certainly one of the questions I asked some, some women a long time ago in another, another book I wrote was, was about that sort of separation between intimacy and, and sex. Um, and, it, and it seemed that some of the women I spoke to had a much more typically male perspective on that that it was almost easy for them to have the physical um, relationship of sex and not need to, to have any kind of intimate feelings, which, which typically we often think is, is something that women sometimes require. So, so sometimes having a much more pragmatic relationship with, with people, with sex, with needs, that this is what I need, I'm going to ask for it, I'm going to have it, and that's off I, off I go. Um, one young woman I, I met, I, I, you know, I, I have no opinion, I'm not condoning or condemning any of this. I, I'd worked with her for a while and I did some work for her and, um, and she, she didn't have any money and I, and I didn't charge her any money. Um, and, a, and a year or two later, she came back and she said, I've, I've got the money, I can, I can pay you for the work you did with me. She said, I decided that I was so bad at choosing partners and kept getting into all of these difficult situations with unsuitable men that I decided that I would start to charge them. 
so I'm now working uh, as a prostitute, um, and I'd like to pay you for the work that you did for me. Um, so, well, forget, forget the kind of judgmental stuff there. For her, that was working. She wasn't vulnerable. She was making an active choice in some way. I mean, you may disagree with that, and, and you know, that, 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 that's absolutely fine. But, it, but for her perspective, it made sense in some kind of way to, to be able to do that. You know, she felt safe. She, she felt, well, why not? Um, and again, we sometimes have to uh, release our judgment on other people's uh, choices in life. Um, and she, she felt that that was a, a good thing. Uh, we also know, as I said before, higher numbers of uh, sexual gender uh, orientation and, and uh, identity in autistic people. Um, a number of asexual autistic women, uh, there was a study again by Simon Baron Cohen, um, who found a, a large number of asexuality uh, in autistic women. Um, uh, or, yeah, or, or women, women who show this autistic uh, phenotype. And again, I've, I've certainly met women who've said that they have never, ever had any sense of romantic or sexual feeling towards another person ever in their lives. It, it's an active... Um, it's just not part of who they are. It's, it's not a choice. They're not deciding not to be with anyone. They're just saying, it's just not in me to be with, with anyone. It just doesn't, doesn't occur to me to, 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 be, to be that way. That's not without its problems. I think there's still a loneliness sometimes that can come with that, to finding somebody that's willing to accept that level of companionship that you, you might be kind of, kind of happy with. Um, certainly in the research that I've done, and, and there's very, very little of it out there, that, that for some women, um, they are early in their first sexual relationships. They get talked into things. They think it's a way of acceptance. If somebody wants to be with you, then you're grateful because you're desperate to fit in. Um, quite a lot of the women suggested um, that, that later on in their lives, they realized that these relationships were quite predatory and quite unhealthy, but at the time, they hadn't seen it. They were just so happy that somebody chose, chose them given their history of being kind of, kind of weird and, 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 and uh, yeah, odd in, in the world and un, unaccepted. Uh, promiscuous behaviour sometimes seen, again, either because it's an active choice that I want to have sex with people, so why shouldn't I? But sometimes, again, just not really understanding the boundaries, not really understanding your, your own sense of self-esteem and self-respect and, and what these people kind of want from you. Sometimes it's just hard to say no because you don't know if you're allowed to say no. But if somebody chooses to be with you, then who am I to say that they can't? You know, enormous self-esteem stuff going on for, for, for some people. Another one of my highly academic uh, Twitter surveys that I did um, was to uh, ask people, uh, and these were all women that responded, what love meant to them uh, in, in an autistic perspective. Um, and love means uh, wanting to spend time with someone every day without gouging my own eyes out. <laughs> We are a romantic bunch, the autistic uh, people. <laughs> I've never met anyone who irritates me less than he does. <laughs> and I absolutely relate to that, completely relate to that. If every single person in the world is irritating, then you just have to find one that's least irritating <laughs> than, than all, all the others. Um, my Valentine's card, and I think my partner Keith uh, feels the same, because my Valentine's card this year said, I hate you the least. <laughs> And the one last year said, I'm still not sick of you. <laughs> it's warm and passionate in my house. <laughs> but certainly there's this kind of sense, again, as I kind of mentioned before, that being with people is selective. It's selective people in a selective way. And often it's people that get you. It's people that accept you as you are, that, that are allowed to see the real you when the rest of the world is, is hidden it, it, that's hidden, hidden from it. Being in a bubble with this one person who feels like an extension of yourself, it takes no effort to be with them, while it takes so much effort to be with anyone else on the planet. Sometimes, something I've realized fairly recently is I quite often describe my life as, as you know, time when I'm out at work and time when I'm alone. And when I describe time when I'm alone, I'm not actually hardly ever alone. I am usually with my partner. But I don't describe him as a person. He's all, well, this is a good thing, calm yourself. <laughs> his negative impact, his presence is so non-existent that it's just... <laughs> ne <laughs> You're just cruel, this is cruel. <laughs> He's in the room, don't be mean. <laughs> he just has no negative impact. It's as good as being alone. And if you're autistic, there is nothing better than being alone. So to be a person who can be with you and it still be on that level, that's love. That's as good as it gets, I think.
So thank you for being mean. But uh, there we go. I'm nearly finished. I'm nearly finished. So the perfect partner, the perfect friend is often uh, fairly typical. There was a study came out uh, recently that said that autistic people were 10 times more likely to have an autistic partner than have a neurotypical partner. So if you thought it was just your partner that was on the autistic spectrum, <laughs> you need to look in the mirror. <laughs> It's very high for autistic people to have relationships with ADHD partners and bipolar partners. Odd attracts odd. And I think that works for a lot of people. And I know that there are also relationships with people who have Asperger's and, and not, which also work beautifully. But certainly for, for me, uh, you know, the idea of, of, of having a relationship with somebody who, who was neurotypical would just feel extraordinarily like hard work. Um, so being around people who are similar to you, whether they're diagnosed or not, it doesn't matter. So when we're thinking about friendships, when we're thinking about relationships, where are people that are similar to you? Is it in interest groups? Is it in exercise? Is it online? Where are they? They are likely to be the kind of people that make you feel that you're able to be more yourself, that, that is just a kind of lower impact social interaction. And sometimes those are likely to be one-to-one. -one. Sometimes they might be time-bound. They might be short um, and, and having to be managed uh, in, in that kind of way. So it's, it's just trying to find the, the place that fits uh, for, this, for this individual. There, there needs to be a kind of, a kind of sharing of, of those, those sorts of things. In terms of professional support, we need to kind of think about, obviously, um, collecting relevant information for these diagnoses and making sure that the women are not missed um, and making sure that their full profiles are shared with people. Um, that if we just do that kind of tick box thing, does she have friends, does she have interests, we're not necessarily going to pick up the full picture from, from who she is and, and in order to get, get that. A lot of families I know don't understand that autism in women can be different. And a lot of families, if their daughter's not been diagnosed until teenage years or, or later, they've not had that kind of early introduction into autism, which, which some people do, where your kids are diagnosed at three or four, and you're kind of in it, you're getting training, you've got you know, people coming in and sorting this stuff out. If you've got to 15 or 16, and, and your daughter's just your daughter, and then all of a sudden she has this diagnosis, um, there's an inclination to kind of go, oh, well, that's just who she is. And quite often I've had parents kind of coming along and, and coming to things like this and going, oh my God, I didn't realize that was a thing, that actually she's just part of this huge community. And I think that's important that families understand that their daughter is not just an individual person with a bunch of quirks, that, that actually there's a whole network of understanding and, and, and uh, company and, and relationships that she might be able to tap into. Um, but the later you're diagnosed, the less likely you are to, to get into, into those sorts of things. We also need to think very carefully about sexual health and sexual awareness. This stuff doesn't come naturally. And again, being smart doesn't help you at all. Um, I'm a very smart person, but I have been in many, many dangerous situations um, because I've not been able to see the danger at all. Um, and and been surprised afterwards when, when I've ended up in, in trouble being assaulted because I've not read people's in, uh, intentions. I've, I've ended up in places... I, I've frequently said over my life, I'm surprised not to be in bits in a ditch, that, that genuinely I am extraordinarily socially naive um, and yet clever. And I think people find that incredibly difficult. Couldn't you tell? What's the matter with you? How could you not see that that was going to happen? Because I couldn't. And, and, you know, and sometimes people say, well, can't you learn? You've got to this age in your life. Can't you learn? The answer is no, because every single person you meet is different. Some are good, some are bad. And if you can't tell the difference, you have two choices. You trust everyone or you trust no one. What do you want to do? You either put yourself at risk to a degree and you get out there and you make life as good as it can be, or you shut yourself in a cupboard because you're too frightened to go out. And I don't think that's what we want for our girls. They need advocates, they need mediators, they need buddies, they need someone to check on to say, this is what's going on, is it okay, help me. Because we don't always have that ability to make those judgments for ourselves and to, and to, remain, to remain safe uh, in, in being able to, to, to do so. She should never compare herself to non-autistic women. It's a whole different ballgame. It's like comparing cats to dogs. There are some shared features, but there are some enormously different features. It's just often setting yourself up to fail um, because the things that you're looking at are the things that, that are not necessarily your strengths. And that's that 
flexible sociability that, that non-autistic young women have. There are lots of amazing people out there writing and talking about their experiences. Uh, Rosie King uh, is a young woman who's done a TED talk, has been seen by about three million people. Um, Alice King has a, uh, sorry, Alice Rowe has a, um, an organization called the Curly Hair Project, where she produces uh, little booklets for, for teenage girls on the autistic spectrum. Alice is on the autistic spectrum herself. Um, there's a school in Britain called Limsfield Grange. They've been on TV. They are a specialist female autism school. Um, the YouTube videos, the girls, Limpsfield Grange, L-I-M-P-S Field Grange. There's YouTube videos of the girls talking about their experiences. Um, and I'm just in awe of them. To have had that level of self-acceptance at the age of 13 or 14 is just astonishing. Um, and that's what we need to give our girls, that, that there are people out there like me and I'm all right as I am. That, that essentially is, is, is the message. Um, there's a whole bunch of lovely people on Twitter, uh, blogging, uh, women, uh, very, very articulate, very, very vocal. Um, lots, lots of uh, a great autistic female community on, on Twitter. They, they're some of my favorite people I've never met, but they're wonderful. Thank you. And there's one of them there that I've just met for the first time today. <laughs> So autistic women, spaces, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, we need each other um, and to, to find a place for, for, for each other. We need to understand limitations, that despite how able and bright and brilliant she might seem, there may be a time limit to that um, and that, that there might be a toll. And the toll is when you come home from court, school, college, work, um, and you can't be the person you've been all day. Uh, sometimes educators say that the child, the girls particularly, are very different at school and at home. So the child is perfect at school. She's so helpful. She's so sensible. And the parent says, she's a complete nightmare at home. She's screaming. She's crying. She's, she's... And, and the other day, somebody said to me exactly that scenario. And a person from the school said, well, it can't be anything that's happening at school because she's fine here. <laughs> And I said, no, it's exactly what's happening at school that means that she's not fine at home because actually something, she's saving face. She's never going to admit that she's struggling because that's failure in autism world. And who gets it in the net? It's the parents at home. Talk to each other. There is something going on here. This is about holistic management, not, phew, we're all right. <laughs> Off you go and rip your bedroom to pieces. Um, it's not okay. We, we have to communicate to, to make sure that that's okay. Don't judge her against her female peers. Sadly, I have met parents, uh, specifically mothers, who are very disappointed in having an autistic daughter because they can't go shopping with her because she's not fluffy. I swear, I, it's, it's awful um, at times. If you are disappointed in her, do your best not to show it uh, because it's really not good for your mental health. Um, and I've met young women who say sorry to their mum because she doesn't wear makeup and, and can't she just wear nicer clothes and can't we just do this stuff? Um, because you wanted a different daughter, this is the one you've got. Please just look after her as well as, as, well as you can. The sensory stuff is very real. Um, a lot of the women I've spoken to talk about um, being called hypochondriacs, and, and that's certainly something I've lived with a long time and, and is commented on. That, uh, and in fact, I went to see my father-in-law the other week, and on, on meeting, uh, he said, so, how are you and all your ailments? <laughs> Which is kind of weird when you get that perspective from the outside, because for me, I think I'm pretty robust and I'm pretty strong and I'm pretty independent. But actually what other people see is somebody who's always unplugging the plugins because it gives her migraines and she can't eat this and she can't eat that and she's having a sleep and she's got a problem and she's got a kidney ache because she's dehydrated because she's so stressed and she's got vertigo and she's got tinnitus and she's got all of that. But I don't have ailments. This is just <laughs> life. All of this is real. It's, it's, I don't know whether it's because we notice more. I don't know whether it's because we're stressed more. I don't know what it is. But if there's anything that's going to happen, we are going to feel it. We feel everything. And that's exhausting in itself from a health perspective. Um, and it needs taking seriously. We're not trying to make a fuss. We're not trying to be difficult. We're not trying to do any of that. We're just trying to get through the day without having a headache, which is the main goal of my life. Home and her room is her sanctuary. She's not necessarily going to want to hang out with people at the end of the day. She's done that, completely, completely done that. I remember um, my, my partner and I didn't live together for a very long time, and, 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 and we, we talked about that, and, and he said um, that, that being at work was as much as he could handle, and that if he came home to a family, that was just like being at work again. 
that, that it was just people again, um, whereas for a lot of people, going home is warm and relaxing and easy and gentle, but actually for a lot of autistic people, it's just more people. Why would I want to do more of that when I've spent all day at work or at school or at college doing that? There is a capacity. So don't take it personally if she wants to hang out in, in her room. People are often more stressful than they are enjoyable. Even if you're wonderful, you're still stressful. And the fact that we bother at all means that we deeply, deeply love you and care about you. If you're worth a migraine, we really love you. <laughs> there are women in this room that know what I mean. Migraine, yee! <laughs> Alone is not the same as lonely or isolated. We're not necessarily trapped. Alone is wonderful and brilliant at times, not always. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're lonely, um, but we might be. Uh, you know, but it's about kind of what's on offer, really. If just going and shopping or going out to some noisy restaurant is on offer, no thanks, I'll stay by myself. If you'd like to do something individually with me for a short period of time, watch a, watch a film or, or, or eat some food, then yes, I'll gladly join you. So it's very selective about what's there and what's available. Interests are the key in relationships with autistic people. If you want to hook in there, find out what they love, get onto Google and find out something about it. Um, that's your hook in. If you're struggling to, to connect with somebody, then, then the interest is, is often the, the, way, the way to go in um, to, 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 find, to find that kind of, kind of stuff out. Helping these young women and older women to develop a strong sense of themselves, that you're, you're fine as you are. That, that's it, really. That's the, the kind, of, kind of message. And who she can be. She can be without peer, social, gender limitations, formidable, strong, independent, determined, brave, all of these kinds of things. Autism doesn't have to limit you. It just means you have to have a slightly different route through life. And it might be an unconventional route. It might be not the way you thought you'd be. It might not be the way your parents thought you might go. But actually, where you get to, somewhere at the end, you're a pretty good person. And I think that's all I have time for. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, we have some questions. I've been given them in an order, so uh, this, we'll, we'll get through as many as we can before, before lunchtime. Uh, the first one, if you want to encourage a young woman in her 20s to consider an assessment process, how do you help her deal with reluctance due to stigma or apprehension? Um, there are a lot of, I think some of the videos that I told you about, is there's, there's Rosie King, there's, there's the young women from Limsfield Grange. There are a lot of autistic women out there uh, on YouTube talking about stuff. Robin Stewart is another one. Um, I think it's about trying to get her to see that this would be benefit to her. And if you don't know what the benefit would be to her, then you're not going to sell it to her. There has to be a reason why she would put herself through this um, and why it would be and why it needs to be something that she kind of comes to through her own uh, volition. You know, autistic people don't like being forced into things. We will do the opposite and run the other way. Um, so it very much has to be, I think, positive role models, uh, suggestions of how that might benefit her, maybe picking out a few characteristics that you know that she would specifically relate to. Because when we just kind of go, oh, well, you might have autism, that's all kind of big, and if we think that everyone with autism is a bit Sheldon or, or has learning disabilities, then, oh, no, no, that's not me. But what if we said, well, actually, there are some women with autism who are highly gifted in this area or have this kind of skill. So it's kind of being clever and thinking, how does her brain best take on board new ideas? You have to get her on board in an autistic way rather than, if that makes any kind of sense. Right, I'm going to stop there there because I have a whole pile of those there. How do you help a girl who is a perfectionist? She won't accept or ask for help and won't recognize she has Asperger's because it means there is something wrong with her. She doesn't want to be in this tribe. Uh, it doesn't say how old she is. If she's a teenager, just wait a while. Um, of course you don't want to be in this tribe when you're a teenager because you want to be in the other tribe. Um, one of the things I think sometimes is a, a well-meaning mistake is that if a child is diagnosed relatively early, quite often the parents think that they don't want to tell them about the diagnosis. And sometimes they think that what I'll do is I'll wait till everything goes really badly wrong, and then I'll tell them. 
But often when it goes really badly wrong, it's in puberty. Um, and so you're already aware that you're different. You're already aware you don't fit in. Everything in your life is just crap. And then somebody comes along and says, hey, there's a reason for all of this. But I want you to take this reason on board positively. And it's because you're on the autistic spectrum. You're not going to take that on board. You're going to hate it. Because without that, you'd be over there with the cool kids. So you're going to absolutely hate it. So um, I think, and it doesn't entirely answer this question, but I think in teenage years, acceptance is really tough. And it may well be that it's just a matter of kind of waiting and looking after her and gently pointing her in the right direction of some of those more positive role models, people who are cool and autistic. Rosie King has bright red hair. She's so cool. Um, she has a super cool family. She's wonderful. So finding that, that autistic people are somebody you might want to be, that you might aspire to be, um, but also I'd be cautious of waiting until things are wrong before you inform your child that they have the diagnosis. If you can tell them when things are right, then they've got lots of capacity to take that on board. They've got lots of capacity. And there's loads of books out there for young children in accepting and understanding Asperger's that it can just be kind of part of who they are. Um, and then when it gets tough, then you've kind of got the understanding of, well, it's tough because you're a bit different, but you're no less valid. Um, so I think that's, that's an important point. My daughter's friends have high prevalence of gender queer, gender questioning, trans. Can you say a little more about why theoretically, conceptually, this might be the case? Nobody entirely knows, really. There are various theories, and um, obviously there are various routes into homosexuality, gender difference. Some people un unequivocally believe that they are born feeling different than their, their natural birth gender or sexuality. Some people actively choose to, to do those kind of things. So this is the whole, it's, it's a big, big thing. There is no one reason for anything uh, in, in terms of, of, of all of this, this sexuality stuff. What some people suspect is that there are some individuals that because they don't fit with their peer group in a logical black and white way, they say, well, if I get on with girls better than I do boys and I'm supposed to be a boy, maybe this means I ought to be a girl that there's a very, for some autistic people, there's a very logical progression that says, I don't feel right here. Where else could I go? Binary gender, it has to be kind of over here. For some people, undoubtedly, it's not that. It's, it's, it's in their genes, it's in their hormones, it's a, it's a birth thing. They just wake up feeling that they're in a, in a different place. For some people, I think they are less concerned with social constructs of gender and sexuality. Certainly for me and certainly for my partner, we don't really feel gendered at all. We don't, we don't have a sense of what it means to be a woman or a man. Um, I wear dresses because it's one piece of clothing and you don't have to match it with anything else. <laughs> It is nothing to do with feminism or femininity or anything like that. Um, it is a practical solution. I have hundreds of these at home. So don't mistake it for that. I have men's boots on. I have big feet. Um, so for, for some people, it's just, well, I'm just me. There, there is no gender at all. And, and why would I need one? Why would I need to walk in a certain way, behave in a certain way, speak in a certain way? So, And I think if, you, if you're a person whose gender is... is is very solid uh, for you, which I think for a lot of people it is, and, and whose sexuality is very solid, it's incredibly difficult to comprehend what that would feel like if it just wasn't. I, I remember all through my life, people kind of talking about sexuality and kind of, you know, saying, oh, you gay, you straight, whatever. And, and I would always think, but I don't know yet. I, I'm probably straight, but I've not met every woman in the world yet. <laughs> how can you be so sure that somebody might just walk through that door and I'm just knocked off my feet by this person? And in re way, way, way before autism, I've always just been baffled by this certainty that people have. And, and I've, I've no doubt that it exists for many of you, but it just doesn't exist, that, that certainty. I don't want to be a man, but I don't particularly want to be a woman either. I, it, I just want to be a person. Um, and again, in some of, the, some of the books I've written, that was a question that I asked people, you know, how do you feel? What, what, what do you feel? And, and mostly people were just saying, I'm just me. So it's almost as though that kind of social reflection is not happening in the same way, that, that kind of bouncing back of social uh, behaviours. Uh, I remember my, my son is on the autistic spectrum. Um, I remember a sports day at his school. 
um, and all the kids and the little boys, even at the age of five or six, they, they are showing gender characteristics. They've all got their gelled hair and their, their, their soccer kits on and they're, they're being kind of, yeah, I'm going to beat you, I'm going to beat you. And, and off they go, running down the line. And there was a, a, another child with Asperger's in, in the class and the child with Asperger's skipped. <laughs> all the way down the row, completely, you know, completely unconscious of why, in, in terms of a, of a kind of gender role, that this was really weird and, and very kind of unaccept, unacceptable. So I think the whole, the whole trans thing, all of that kind of stuff is, there is no one answer. There are many, many reasons why people choose or don't choose or are born or whatever to be who they are. But I think it's just much looser in autism. Large numbers of the women that I spoke to for my book did not identify themselves as heterosexual um, or necessarily uh, female. They, uh, agender, genderqueer, gender fluid, pansexual, that kind of stuff was much, much more common than, which is unusual because you would expect the majority of people to be straight and you would expect a smaller amount of people to, to not be. Um, some early studies suggest that it could be sort of 30 odd percent of people who are non-heterosexual in the autistic community. Um, which is way, way, way higher than, than any, uh, you know, any typical population in, in terms of those, those sorts of things. But nobody entirely knows why. Could be hormones, could be anything, could be social, could be whatever. You mentioned either shy or bossy as possible social skills used. How often do girls go selective mute when under high anxiety surroundings when too many high function peers? Really, really often, I think, um, absolutely because it's just shut down. I mean, we, we've heard a lot in autism about meltdowns. Um, the opposite is shut down. So rather than it being out there, it's in here. And that just means closing everything off. Um, and that's very much me. That's very much my, I, I can't speak at all if everything gets way, way too much. Um, it, it's basically just, you know, a kind of shutting down all resources. So literally the bare bones of survival are the only ones that are still running. That basic generator in the situation, all the lights have gone off. Everything else is shut down completely. Um, I'm just existing right now. There is nothing coming in at all. Um, it just makes total sense because everything that comes in is, is, added, is added load. And this is a way of reducing load by, by bringing, bringing stuff down. Speech requires processing. Um, and if you can't process because you're absolutely at your limit, then of course you can't speak. I think that, that kind of feels an obvious uh, a solution for some people. Should I push my teenage with uh, Asperger's daughter to be more social, knowing she'll need these skills in adulthood? Um, anybody want to answer that one? Yes or no? I think it's what I said in the talk. It's about selective socialising. Who would she enjoy being with? What would be valuable? Rather than just a kind of blanket, shoving her out the door and go, go and make some friends, which is what some people do. And, and I just think, well, how do you do that? I, you, who, how does anyone do that? It's, it's, it's difficult. I think it's about selective socialising, that, that being a completely shut away by yourself is absolutely probably not a great idea if you want to go out in the world and do good stuff but equally, that's likely to be kind of, kind of limited. And, and I'm sure there will be people here that can tell you their own kind of capacity. Uh, for, for me, kind of once a week for an hour and a half with anybody beyond my immediate family would be pushing it. Um, and that, that, that's on a good week. Uh, if it was a, a, a working week, it could be nobody for five or six weeks at a time that, that I would want to see. So it's also about managing your expectations, what, what you think is an acceptable social life Actually, what does she think is an acceptable social life? Is her call, uh, ultimately. You said that ADHD make poor partners for Aspie women. No, I didn't. Um, I said that they were more likely, uh, that autistic people were supposedly, a piece of research, 10 times more likely to have an autistic partner than a non-autistic partner, eight times more likely to have an ADHD partner than a non-autistic partner. ADHD partners would be absolutely perfectly fine uh, for an autistic person, assuming you get on and like each other and fancy each other uh, in, entirely. Um, I certainly undoubtedly have a bit of both, um, and my partner certainly doesn't. He, he, he's very much autistic. The poor bastard is just running constantly to catch up. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I don't know whether you're a magnet. I think possibly, you, well, you probably know the answer to that. If you, if you, certainly if I look back at all of my relationships, 
they're, they're all on the autistic spectrum without a shadow of a doubt. I am undoubtedly a magnet um, for, uh, for and, and I don't know if anybody else finds this, but Keith and I were at an event the other day and we sat at a table and there were some empty chairs and an entire family came in and, and three out of four of the people were 100% on the autistic spectrum <laughs> and sat at our table and, and, and I, I said to him, that was coincidence, and he said, no, it wasn't. <laughs> they found us. <laughs> Nobody knew who we were, we were in another country, it was, it was completely no way. And it was just like, how does that happen? How does that happen? Does anybody else find that? That you end up sat next to... I was on a cruise ship once in the middle of the ocean and I went swimming in the pool and there was one woman in the pool and I don't tell people I'm autistic on a random basis. And she came up to me and said, oh, I'm autistic. And I was like... <laughs> I just know. I mean, I think the only thing as a woman on the autistic spectrum means that if I ever become single again, there's going to be a queue. Because <laughs> there's all of those men out there looking for low-maintenance women like us. <laughs> right, one more very quickly and then we'll stop. What are the clinical processes technique used to determine a diagnosis? What clinicians are best equipped to make a diagnosis? Once a diagnosis is made, what differences occur? What difference does a diagnosis make? Um, the clinical processes are variable. They are all subjective to some degree. So there are tests involved. There might be psychometric tests. There might be intelligence tests. There will be an interview. There may be school reports. There may be family reports. So it's basically a gathering of a whole bunch of information, applying that to the diagnostic criteria for autism, and then a subjective opinion of a clinician. So what that means is that it depends how good the clinician is, how good you are at presenting the information in the right way, therefore how accurate that, that, that diagnosis uh, might, might be. Um, I, 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 mean, I don't know what the system is here, but I mean, certainly uh, in England, um, we have a national health service, so it is possible to get a, a free paid-for diagnosis um, in, in Britain. And it would take you, for an adult woman, it would take you maybe 18 months to get that diagnosis. Most people that go through that process report that they are turned away um, and not even allowed to, to enter that process because the, the awareness of how women might be, uh, and, and Will had a slide about someone saying, oh, you know, you're, you're, not, you're too bad at maths to be autistic. That kind of stuff is incredibly common. People saying, uh, you've got a child, you can't be autistic. You've got a job, you can't be autistic. You're making eye contact, you can't be autistic. This is really common. Um, so I think if you're selecting a clinician, really, really try and do your homework and find somebody that has experience of adult women um, Otherwise, you're wasting your time and you're wasting your money unless they kind of know what they're doing um, with, with that. Um, in terms of what the difference diagnosis makes, most of the women I meet um, who, who have diagnoses, have assessments, um, it changes their lives. It, it explains everything. They cry, they cheer, they're delighted. It's a huge, huge relief. It allows you to move forward with a framework to say, this is me, this is what I need, this is what I can do, and this is what I can't do. It stops you apologizing all the time, it stops you bending all the time. Typically, your mental health stuff sometimes can get a bit better because you're able to say, mm -mm, not for me. You don't mind your routines so much, you actually accept them as being a good means of, of managing your capacity rather than going, I shouldn't be eating the same food 10 days in a row. I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't be doing that. There's a level of self-acceptance. So I think for adult women, the biggest change in diagnosis is self-acceptance and, and self-knowledge and membership of the tribe to suddenly go out there and go, you do that too? Oh, thank God for that. It's not just me. And there is nothing better than that. And on that note, I think it's time for lunch. Thank you so much.